I wish. <laughs> no, I can't even imagine. What is that like when you watch the movie and see somebody that you're familiar with playing you? It's very strange. <laughs> I can't imagine. It's very imagine. strange. You know, uh, when we were on set, we shot our film in Mississippi, but uh, the director would be calling for, uh, we need Ron on the set because they called the actors by the oh. character they were playing. And I would say, well, here I am. They said, no, no, we need the real Ron, not you. We will. <laughs> And uh, we, need, we need Greg Kinnear. Well, it was very confusing, and it took a few days to get used to it. And then they would say, is Debbie here? And I would say, oh, she died. You... <laughs> Did you and read they, the book? <laughs> yes. They didn't know that oh, no. she had died. Oh, no. Oh, no. And uh, so it was very, very odd. And then when you see it on the big screen. I can't imagine. And you walk into a movie theater, and it's packed with people, and you sit next to someone that doesn't know that you're in the film. Right. And then you hear what they're talking about, you know, so it's really... It was, it was a really weird experience. Did they get but, it right? But rewarding, yeah. Did they get the movie right? Did they get your? Did well, you I feel wrote like it. I wrote I the screenplay? So. I know, but I know sometimes. <laughs> oh well, you know, a book uh, to a I movie. have every uh, bit of uh, control that is possible when you're dealing with a major uh, oh, uh, good. studio like Paramount. You know, I, I was in the selection of the the actors, the uh, the locations, uh, the, the script that I wrote. But I didn't get the final cut, and I wrote a movie that was two hours and seven minutes long, and they wanted a one hour and 57 minute movie. So they discriminately, at their choice, cut out 10 minutes, and some of them were my favorite they scenes. The 10 but the good news is we now have a Blu-ray that's out this last week, and it put back in the oh, scenes that were cut out. So. I love that. <laughs> you got your movie after all. Yeah, so. That's really fantastic. Well, if you don't mind, I want to go back just a little bit, but then I really want to talk about your new project. But, so let's just go back just a little bit. One thing that intrigues me a lot about your story, I think I told you that one thing that we want to do here at The Power of One is get these videos in front of kids to help them understand that they do not have to know what they want to do with the rest of their lives when they're 11 years old. They do not have to know that to take the right classes so they can get in the right classes in high school so they can get in the right college because the likelihood that that's what they're going to do for the rest of their lives is pretty unlikely. And your story, you went to TCU, studied finance, went into banking, and then I love the story about your first piece in Houston. Can you tell us about that? In Houston? The, yeah, the when piece. I bought my, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I, I had just gotten an MBA in finance, and I was, really was intent on being a, a, a uh, investment banker. So I was buying some water and sewer bonds in Houston, Texas uh, at an auction and I had a few minutes to kill so I went into uh, the art museum and I went into a gallery and I ended up buying and spending uh, half of my first month's salary on a piece of art that I couldn't afford and uh, so that really began uh, in me. I, I met this art dealer who had this fascinating life of traveling all over the world and I was traveling to uh, Houston, Texas to buy water and sewer bonds, and that just didn't sound too exciting to me. The thought of traveling So I asked him, work. I said, how do you get a job like you have? And he said, you, you don't get a job like this, you just have to do it. So I'd never taken an art course or anything in my life, so I began to teach myself the art of being an art dealer. I love the serendipity of how you just went into a place and you saw a piece and you had to have it even though it didn't make any sense. And then you became a really big art well, dealer. And, and my new project is called For Art's Sake and it's about a Texas art dealer. And I'm writing it as a TV series. We're pitching it to Netflix right now. And uh, it was about a Texas art dealer in the 70s. And it's not so much about the art that he's selling, it's about the deal. And it's all the kind of the, the things that go on behind. You know, if you walk into a museum and you see a beautiful Picasso painting hanging on the wall and you think, oh, I wonder what Picasso was thinking. And maybe you may get it right, you may not. But the more interesting story is a lot, a lot of times is how did that painting actually end up here in this museum? And you know, who had to die? Who got shot? Who slept with who? It was all of the backstory and the intrigue of getting that painting from the artist's studio to the collector into the museum that is sometimes more uh, exciting and, uh, and, and entertaining than the art itself. So. And every piece has a story, right? Oh, the, some of them are incredible. Did yeah. you see the movie The Red Violin? 
One of the first guys that well, bought a yes, piece of art. Well, yes, my very first client, and my very he was the first investor into our film uh, most recently, but uh, 40 years ago, he was my first client that I sold a painting to. His name was Jerry Freeman. He owned a lot of car dealerships and banks in Dallas. He turned 95 years old last night, and they asked me to introduce the film on his life uh, last night. So that's, is I it a film to get that done. Is it a film in wide him. release, or is it something oh, no, we no, can no. see? It was, okay. it was just uh, his wife had a documentary gotcha. made, and uh, oh, since so he had invested in our film, I was, they asked me to do that. That's so special. So you wrote the same kind of different as me, and you have sold over two million copies, mm -hmm. and you were on the New York Times bestseller list for 156 weeks or something? Three and a half years. So. Three and a half years. That's just Three amazing. Three and a half years. We made number one on the New York Times bestselling list. So. That has to feel really good. Yeah. It's a really special story to you. Obviously. Well, you know, when you write a book, and you've, it's your first book, and, uh, and you're telling a personal story, right. and I've never written a book. You know, I wrote it 13 times. And my friend Denver, the homeless man that we wrote about, right. it was his idea to write the book. He told me, he said, Mr. Ron, there ain't nobody ever going to believe our story. We got to write us a book. Wow. And I said, well, what's this we, Kemosabe? You don't read and you don't write, so who's going right? to write this book? <laughs> and he said, well... You know what I mean. Um, I, I'm going to tell you my part of the story, and you write it down. And so you already know your part, and so uh, you write that down. And we get through with the two of them, we'll put them together, and we'll have us a book. So we did so for the next three and a half years. After Debbie died, he moved in with me. And that's what the new book right, that you've been right. given today yes, is. Yes. It's called Working Our Way Home. That's the 10 years from my wife's death where the movie ends and the first book ends until the 10 years that we lived together, raising each other and saving each other. It was, uh, it was a quite an adventure of the most, uh, I guess, the oddest couple that ever moved in and lived together. But uh, he told me, he said, nobody's ever going to believe this, uh, our story. So we wrote us a book for three and a half years, we sat at the breakfast table, and when we got finished, I said, we got turned down more than the sheets in a five-star hotel. We could not find anybody that was willing to publish our book or give us a, an interview for the book. Uh, and uh, so we self-published the book. And, but one of our self-published books got in the hands of a major publisher, and they republished it under their brand. And uh, the first TV show we were on um, to, to publicize that book was in Boston, Massachusetts. And the host asked us that morning, as he said, this morning, he said, we have two guests here that are best friends that have co-authored a beautiful book on hope and friendship and redemption. But let's start this morning with Denver Moore. And Denver was my homeless friend who was illiterate, had never been to school a day in his life. And uh, the host said, Denver, can you tell us a little bit about your book? And Denver just stared at the uh, camera. It was like a deer in the headlights. So, you know, in, on live television, silence doesn't play very well. And probably five or six, seven seconds had gone by, and so the host was about to shift the question to me. And... And I was about to jump in and answer when Denver just kind of pushed me back and said, now hold on just a minute. And he pointed right at the camera and he said, now I'm going to tell you all the truth. Now I don't read and I don't write. So I didn't write that book and I ain't even read it. Now what's your next question? So, <laughs> that's so beautiful that that was captured. That's, really that's cool. how we started our TV career. What an amazing story about how it's not an us versus them. There's, a, there's a, a saying that you have that's in the book that says that the difference in us is not the color of our skin. Well, no, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a whole, this, in, in, our, um, in our movie, in our story, I know, I think it illustrates beautifully that it's not the color of our skin that divides us, that divides our nation, that divides our cities and communities. It's not the color of our skin. It's the condition of our hearts. And if we get the condition of our hearts right, you know, we accept everyone. We become uh, colorblind. We, uh, and it's almost like, um, you know, when Willie was talking about the homeless being invisible, you see these signs. You know, we want the homeless to become invisible. Most citizens do. And my friend Denver used to tell me, he said, because everybody looks at the homeless as a problem. Right. 
He said, but God looks at them as an opportunity for the faithful to show the love of God. In fact, my friend used to tell me, the first day I was with my friend on the, sitting on the curb after we became friends, it took Denver. me five months to become friends. We're sitting on the curb of his school, which was a dumpster where he lived in the inner city of Fort Worth. So I'm sitting on the curb by his dumpster, and, uh, and I asked him, I said, well, what's it like to be homeless? I was just trying to break the ice and start a conversation with a homeless man who had threatened to kill me. So, but, uh, and he said, uh, well, I don't know. Why don't you tell me? And I said, well, Denver, I've never been homeless before. And he looked at me, and he said, well, whether we's rich or whether we's poor or something in between, this earth ain't no final resting place. So in a way... We's all homeless, just working our way home. And I love that Willie called his organization, We're All Homeless. And, and that uh, I, first time I heard that came from the mouth of my homeless friend. And then he looked at me and he said, uh, are you one of them Christians? And I said, well, yeah, that's why I'm down here helping. He said, no, you ain't down here helping. He said, you're blessing people. He said, you think giving by somebody a dollar or putting some spaghetti on a plate is actually helping somebody? He said, no, the only person you're helping is yourself. Feel better about yourself because you ain't done nothing for nobody but yourself in so long. You're just trying to make yourself feel better about yourself. I said, oh, okay. I said, so what is it you want to know? He said, I want to know why all you Christians worship one homeless man on Sunday and turn your back on the first one you see on Monday. Wow. He said, Mr. Ron, you never know whose eyes God is watching you out of, and it ain't going to be your preacher or your Sunday school teacher. He said, it might just be a fellow that looks like me, wow. like you saw on that video that Willie showed. He said, but it ain't me, but it might be a fellow that looks like me checking you out to see what kind of fellow you really are. Was he one of the wisest men that he you knew? He was the wisest man I've ever known in my life. It sounds he like He was a, so extraordinary. Yeah. It sounds Every like day. A, he came up with these things I called Denverisms because <laughs> he had something really profound to say every day. And I write about that in the new book, oh, uh, Working Our Way Home. And I wrote about it in our first book, Same Kind of Different as Me. So, oh, so. good. Isn't that amazing? All of the people that you've had in your life from the finance end and from the art dealing end and all of the educations that you've experienced and all of the educated people. And Denver was one of the wisest. So that, it's almost like he was an angel. Well, he called Debbie a stubborn angel. Did he? Because she wouldn't give up on him. Right. And if you've seen our movie, and uh, if you heard just a little bit of it then, uh, Brad Paisley saw our movie. We, we, uh, one of our other producers was a friend of Brad Paisley's, and he said, we're looking for somebody to write an original song. He said, let me see the movie. So he, wrote, he saw the, the film and came up with this song he wrote called Stubborn Angel. He didn't know that Denver used to call her a stubborn angel, but right? it was such a beautiful song. I thought it might even get an Oscar nomination. And we had several critics that said Denver, my friend, or, or Jaime Hansu, who played Denver, that they thought he deserved an Oscar nod for his role as Denver in our film. But uh, we didn't hear from the Oscars. But, uh, anyway, I'm still proud of the film. It's, yeah, it's great yeah, film. that's really it, cool. It's, uh, it, but we did hear that people all across America on the opening night of our film at when the credits, end credits were rolling, they were standing in the theaters and giving it a standing ovation. Oh. And we've heard from literally hundreds of people since then of things that they did directly as a result of seeing the film that day. So one person walked out in the power of one and said, I'm going to do something for our community, for our city. And we've been hearing this over and over again now for the last three or four months since the film came out. I love that. And, and you know that every person who was in a theater watching it they're all out there touching 10 or 20 or 30 other people themselves. And when your eyes are open to helping others, even if it's through homelessness from your film, your eyes get open to helping others in all kinds of ways. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, our movie is just to show how an act of kindness can, can be, uh, make a profound change in a person's life or in a situation. Um, well, for example, I had a terrible relationship with my father. And I had never shown him an act of kindness because I couldn't stand him. And so Denver recognized that. And he told me, he said, Mr. Ron, your daddy's got a lot of hell in him. And sometimes you just got to bless the hell out of people. Wow. <laughs> and so uh, he said, you need to start blessing the hell out of your old daddy. Wow. 
So I started blessing the hell out of my father. And within a year, uh, and my father hated Denver. Hated. My father was an old racist, and he could not stand the fact that I had moved in a homeless black man into my home. And, uh, and so, but within a year after we began blessing the hell out of my father, uh, he and Denver became best friends, and, and, and Denver helped take care of him the last couple of years of his life. So it was, it it was a beautiful, worked. beautiful friendship there. I've written another book about that. It, it comes later. So You have uh, so after, many books in you. Wow, that's really beautiful. Did your father, did your father move in with you, the two of you? Did the three of you live together? No, no, my no. father uh, had his own home. He wanted to move in with me, but... <laughs> Ron said no. He said, if you're going to move that guy in, why didn't you choose me first? He said, I'm your daddy. I said, I never liked you, daddy, so uh, ah. you, never were, you never were much of a daddy. You know, he was always uh, in the bars and things. He was never around as a daddy, and... Uh, so at 89 years old, all of his uh, drinking buddies had died, and so he decided he wanted to be my best friend. And it was too late, but it wasn't too late wasn't because too late. Denver saw the worth in him that I didn't see, and oh. we ended up with a beautiful friendship, and he became the daddy that I always wanted. So. Oh, my, is he still living? No, no, he no. died uh, five years ago. Okay. That's beautiful that you were able to have that healing. I did, yeah. You blessed the hell out yeah. of him. We blessed the hell out of him. Oh, my so. gosh. That spe you know, the three energy healers that we just had up here, that really speaks to the power of, of no matter what you think it is. If, if you think it's just thought or if you think it's prayer, whether you think it's to a God or, yeah. or universal wisdom or whatever, the shift that you made within you ended up shifting him. Yeah. And you got to have that great relationship. That's so cool. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a wonderful thing. It was oh. one of my proudest moments is the reconciliation with my father. Oh. We begin to show that at, toward the end of the film, but not ultimately oh. what happened. So That's we save so that nice. for the sequel, which you will read a little bit about in, the, in the Working Our Way Home. So. Is there anything in the works for Working Our Way Home to become a film? Well, I've started writing a screenplay for it. Yes, yeah. as a sequel. So you're, you're a screenwriter also. Well, I've written a few screenplays. I've had one made so far, right, but right, I've right. written now. The, I'm reading, writing a screenplay now for uh, uh, my book called For Art's Sake. Tell me about a that TV a little series. bit. So that's the one that the one that's going to Netflix. Yeah, that's the it's one that the we're talking about. Gotcha. The art dealer, and uh, his name is Art, and it's all about the art of the deal, and not necessarily the art itself, because art okay. was kind of a scoundrel like me. And, uh, it's based on my life, not loosely, but very closely. But I have changed the names of a lot of people to protect the guilty. So <laughs> That's one thing about you, that I, I'm really impressed with how brave you are, I think, to put, to put so much truth out there in the same kind of different as me. Just in the trailer, there are things that you just put out there. Did you feel compelled to do that from knowing how it can heal other people to well, see people's I flaws? heard from so many people when I wrote book no one had known about my affair and my infidelity and my wife never ratted me out she she forgave me and and i use the words that she threw my sin as far as the east is from the west and never brought it up again wow. and the only thing she wanted was me to be faithful and so i promised her that uh for that forgiveness i would do anything that she asked me the rest of our lives together and uh and she just, she blessed the hell out of me. Oh. And, um, and I didn't realize that when I made that promise that 10 years later she would ask me to be friends with a homeless man who was a known killer named Suicide on the streets who threatened to kill me the first time I ever met him. So, Ooh, that was a promise you made was, in faith. I was, and then I was there you keeping were. my promise, and I Very did. Nice. And it became the most profound thing that ever happened to me in my life. And I tell people that I, I, I became uh, wealthy as an art dealer, mm -hmm. but my life was never rich mm -hmm. until I made friends with Denver. And he made my life so rich and blessed me. And I gave everything up to work for the homeless now for the last almost 18 years. So I know. Tell um, us a little yeah, bit about we've that. We've raised close to $100 million for the homeless. Right. All across America. Yes, you travel yeah. all the time, yeah. right? Yes, you go everywhere and talk to all kinds of people about your story. And this next story, do you mind telling us just a little bit, or not just a little bit, but 
how did things shift for you in Denver after Debbie died? I know that he moved in with you, but did the relationship? Well, he thought, first of all, if you know our book and know our story, and even the film, uh, we had a meeting uh, when we became friends that he called a catch and release friendship. And he told me uh, one day, when I asked him if he would be my friend, he said he would have to think about it. it. I was so arrogant, I thought, I can't believe, buddy, you just looked a gift horse in the mouth. That after all, you are the man of my wife's dream, and if she wants you to have some new clothes, and I'm just trying to pay my penance for the, being a, 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 a cheating husband. So if you want some new clothes or a car, an apartment, a home, I can do anything for you because I'm rich and you're poor, and you should be thankful for that I want to be your friend. But that's arrogance. I thought he had nothing to offer me in a friendship, but I would just be his benefactor and if he would behave himself and clean up. And um, so at that, at that uh, catch and release meeting, he had told me, he said, if you're just a white man that's fishing for a friend and you're going to catch and release, mm. then I ain't got no desire to be your friend. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, my gosh, well, I, now I have to make a decision. I didn't really want to be his friend. I was just doing it for Debbie. But all of a sudden, it switched on to me. I have to make this commitment now. Am I going to be a friend with someone who is a different race, different socioeconomic, someone that I have seen threaten to kill people, and I, including me? And am I going to do this and not catch and release? Am I going to stay his friend for life? And if I ever heard from God in my life, I didn't hear any voice, but I did hear just in my soul. Felt it. Take a chance. Mm. Be his friend. Mm. And, um, and so I said, okay, Denver, I will not catch and release if you'll be my friend. And he said, then you have a friend for life. And I said, you do too. And um, that's how the story away? lived. And then after Debbie died, he moved in with me. I, actually, I did catch and release. If you see in the film, when, after Debbie died, I just needed to break. I just needed, it was so, her death and cancer and pain was so intense that I just needed to get away. So I, I moved to Italy for five months and Denver was back in the hobo jungle in the dumpster. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so um, after five months in Italy where I began writing, uh, I, I woke up one day and realized uh, that I needed to go home. Mm -hmm. that the story that I needed to write was back in the hobo jungle. And so I went back and uh, got him from the hobo jungle and moved in with me and we built the life together. I say, we, we were thrown together to save each other. So. Thrown together to save each other. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing your stories in both of the books. I really look forward to reading the second one. One of the greatest gifts to me is what you just said about how our society values money and stuff so much that so many people strive, 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 strive for that and acquire it and still have emptiness and judge people with less than and make assumptions that their lives can't, can't be, possibly be as rich. So it shifts perspective. It makes you see people differently. It's one of the most valuable lessons Denver taught me. And that was the first day I was walking the streets with him. I started talking negatively about some of the people that were too drunk to get up and take my dollar bill. So, mm. you know, I'd stuff it in their shirt. And he looked down and he said, uh, what do you see down there at the end of the street? And I said, what are you talking about? What do you see down at the end of the street? And I said, well, what I'm seeing is a courthouse. He said, exactly. He said, let me tell you something. That courthouse is full of judges and God don't need no more judges. He said, God needs servants. So if you're going to come down here, you leave your judges rolled back at your house and you just bring your servants attitude come here and we're going to get along fine. So, <laughs> I wish I could have met Denver. He just sounds like such a treasure. Thank you for sharing him with us. Well, Is there anything you want to leave us with about um, your story or the book or just a lesson that you hope people get from it or from your life? Well, you know, I, I really I do hope that, uh, that people will want to see the visible. They will want to see uh, homelessness with, different, with new eyes. Uh, that they will begin to look at the homeless. And, you know, I think now most people, including me, which I did for years, I would see a homeless person. And if I would start to have an encounter or get close to them or they get close to me, the first thought was like, what's going to happen to me if I stop and help or have a, a, a conversation with this very unpleasant looking person? But I want people to retrain their brains 
to when they see that situation to think, what is going to happen to him if I don't stop? Wow, that's powerful. That's pow you can't, you can't, they can't be invisible and you can't ignore them if you look at them that way. Thank you for that and thank you for being with us here today. I thank really, you. really appreciate it. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank God this is me on Blu-ray. <laughs>